Welcome, everybody. You're at Inman Connect, except Connect Now, our first virtual digital conference. And we're so excited to have you, people from all over the world. You know, five months ago, I stood before the Connect audience in New York City, and I was so optimistic. I had an optimistic message about the economy, the housing market, and the coming digital age. How wrong could I have been? A pandemic, record unemployment, businesses closed down everywhere, maddening social isolation, and now a heartbreaking and painful week for America. The ancient Greeks might have contended that the fickle gods blessed us in the winter and cursed us in the spring. What is next? Indeed, what is next? If we underestimate the virus, it will find us. If we underestimate the tattering economy, we will make the wrong calculations. Ignoring deep-seated prejudice will be our undoing. Just last year, the industry was forced to face the stains of prejudice once again when Long Island's Newsday revealed patterns of housing discrimination. While we must be part of the solution, we can also be part of the problem and it must change. How do we move forward? Together, all of us must use the uncertainty about the present to imagine a new future. Getting back to business is essential but not business as usual. We must act with a new compassion and a broad denouncement of inequities, injustice, and violence. It starts with companies like Inman News doing more to elevate unrepresented voices and to report on the systematic issues underlying our current turmoil. And across the board, industry leaders must step it up and do more than vague commitments to diversity, charities, and economic fairness. For one, minorities and women are conspicuously absent from boardrooms and executive suites, a poor reflection on our community and a sad statement about where we stand as an industry. Redfin CEO Glenn Kalman says, this isn't just about recruiting though, it's leaders spending a lot of time with employees of color to make them feel truly welcome at our companies, not just permitted or tolerated. It all begins with each of us. All of us have personal stories from these last few months that will be etched into family and professional memories for generations to come. They become a foundation for doing things different and stay, taking steps to make our lives and others better. We cannot be expected to heal all the broken parts of our society, but we can each show love, compassion, and understanding with our families and our communities. Like each of you, I have worked all the muscles of being human in the last three months, and all of our human emotions have come pouring out. Happiness, sadness, disgust, anger, fear, surprise, and laughter. This time that we've had has fortified the value of home, family, friends, and simpler things in our life like community, collaboration, and service. We cannot get worn out by these events. We must get back to business and do so with confidence. People need you now more than ever. Showing up has never been more important. We do not have to be heroic. We do not have to perform courageous acts, but we must be present for ourselves, for our family, and for our friends, and for our customers. Yes, it is really hard to imagine heaven while living through hell, but we have no other choice right now. Now more than ever, we must exercise the three dimensions of our IQ. Our emotional intelligence has never been more important including listening, empathy, and service to those who need us. We must have high market intelligence. People are confused, and they have never needed your local insight more than now. And you must have a very high tech IQ, embracing the digital experiences that help you and your customers. Like everyone, I embraced Zoom Airlines and got to visit with 20,000 realtors all over the world in the past three months. This was physically impossible before. What did I learn? That our industry is a colorful cast of characters 
that mirrors our nation. People of different colors, different points of view, and different approaches to life and its challenges. It is powerful if we put it in motion. We have a bigger mission now. We must make an individual and collective commitment together to help those who need to find housing. That has never been more important. This community is up to the challenge because that is what you do every day. But we must remove the pain and the points of getting there. This is our digital spring, a technology awakening. In that speech in January, I dreamed out loud that we would make the transaction easier, but I had no clue that the invisible hand of a pandemic would make that dream come true. With our backs against the wall, the industry is adopting the great technology made possible by so many entrepreneurs. To all of the technology innovators out there, you are helping to save this industry from COVID-19 with your amazing creations. We now have the ability to communicate digitally, list property virtually, to market digitally, to sign contracts electronically, and negotiate virtually, and attend an Inman conference virtually. Wow. But now you can focus on what is important to your clients and get back to your most productive activities, listing, selling, and most importantly, helping people get in and out of homes. This indeed has been a scary and tragic time, but has also been about amazing achievements, unselfish acts, and lasting memories. The poet Carl Sandburg once wrote, the fog comes in on little cat feet, and it sits looking over harbor and city on silent haunches and then moves on. This tiny poem got me thinking about the fog in San Francisco, where I am today, and COVID-19. Almost every summer day, the fog comes through the Golden Gate Bridge and defines our lives here. It affects our work, our play, our mood, and even our daily decisions. Then in the fall, its season is over and it leaves. As we just begin to see through the fog of all these tragic events, we must realize that this too has an end. Not knowing when exactly is daunting and not yet understanding the full consequences is scary. But there is solace in knowing that this torment, not its memories, will too pass through our lives. And so what is my big idea, the title of this talk? Well, the big idea is you, the new you, who was born in March of this year, the new you who embraces this moment and all of its challenges, facing it because we have no other choice, the new you who growls back at COVID-19, who navigates a struggling economy, and who stands up to injustice and inequality, the new you who is courageously getting back to business serving others, doing what you do best. And I'm here to stand behind you in everything you do. I love you. I love the Inman community. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Brad. No one could say it any better. Um, now we want to uh, think about the future. Think about a comeback because it's already here. Uh, the future has come much faster than any of us thought. And uh, boy, are we excited to learn about it over the next three days. So allow me to welcome back to the virtual stage, Brad Inman and CEO of Zillow, Rich Barton. Someone I think I met, oh my God, 25 years ago. Hello, everybody. This is. Hello, everybody. So we're ready to go into our first interview of the day. Um, I'm really lucky to have with me Rich Barton, someone I met 25 years ago at Microsoft back in the days when he was inventing Expedia and I was working on something called Home Advisor with Microsoft. And we've shared a lot of memories and times together and a lot of stage time. I think this is our first digital experience. But uh, Rich, are you there? Welcome. Wait, I'm not, I wasn't talking, Brad. I'm talking now. Can you hear me? There he is. I am, ta I am I talking can. now. We're there. 
And I think we're with the Big Inman community, right? We're live? Uh, I think we are. Rich, how are you? I'm fantastic, Brad. How are you doing? I'm sorry we, uh, you know, we have, we forgive our technical difficulties now, don't we? Yeah, well, you and I have launched a lot of products in the 25 years, and we like to point to all the ones that work perfectly at launch, but we also know there were many of them that didn't work perfectly. So we're in that category, fail until you succeed. So uh, anyway, we're here, and that's the most important thing. First, how are you doing? I guess that's your bedroom. It looks like you have a king-size bed. I do have a king-size bed that I was in an hour ago, maybe an hour and a half ago. Um, I have a guitar back there that people accuse me of having to be a prop, but it's actually meditative for me. Uh, I have a big red oh, chair God. that I that I relax in. But yeah, no, I've been living in my bedroom because I don't have an office, Brad. I don't have an office in my house. Do you need a loan? I wish I you did. can't afford an office, Rich. Well, I'm shopping now. I'm shopping. I'm 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 part of this bubble of demand we're seeing. I I I need an office. I'm either go. going to do a remodel or I'm going. I actually I'm talking about a remodel to put an office in. Well, let's get started. But let's start with something far more somber than some of the things that we we have to deal with. Um, let's start with the events of this past week, Rich. Um, how is Zillow? I saw some things yesterday in the news on Inman. How is Zillow responding? And I guess I really want to challenge you. We all need to respond in a deeper and a bigger way, right? And what is Zillow doing um, to the circumstances that have unfolded, unfolded since you know a week ago and the horrible death in Minneapolis of George Floyd? Yeah, well, the first thing is supporting our employees who are hurting and they're frustrated and they're confused, okay? And so, so supporting in every way we can uh, these employees. Um, that's number one. Number two is uh, making damn sure they know and everybody knows how we feel about racism uh, and broadcasting that, uh, and you know, you know, speaking out against racism. We came out. Maybe, maybe you saw it. We came out. The marketing team and the and the HR team scrambled to work with the black community to come out with a racism has no home here with the Zillow logo that is that is kind of hopefully turning into a bit of a meme to show our support. Um, we also support in many other ways. I, my wife and I personally have our philanthropy for the last seven years, thanks to her, has been focused on criminal justice reform and decarceration. Uh, and those trends were, were, were on, those were happening. And there were really, there have been really good things happening. And I think uh, this awful, terrible incident and the societal reaction to it is actually going to accelerate societal change in a way that we're seeing in technology. We're seeing COVID accelerate trends in technology in every industry, aren't we, Brad? And including our own. And it's going to accelerate social justice as well. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I had in my opening talk that we need to remove the barriers to people uh, getting in and out of homes easier, and I was emphasizing technology. Um, but the last week, it, you know, the, the behavior brought me back to the, the Newsday story a year ago, um, or about a year ago, about discrimination in the housing industry. And it occurred to me as we, I, I woke up this morning, I thought, wow, I bet Zillow and data that you have, you know, there's a depository of information that we could probably take your data scientists and zoom, on and zoom in on behavior maybe, that you know we don't have to go through an elaborate old school testing service. Um, you know I think we should start using our data to to sniff out discrimination or patterns because my worry is after COVID nineteen these patterns of you know are we going to see white flight again? Wouldn't that be a disaster? Um, but anyway, I, I, just a random thought. Maybe we could all you know dig deep into our warehouse of data and our people and our personnel and you know reach a little higher. Um, but one thing that's come up. Uh, and then we'll move on to some other areas, Rich, is how do we get the executive suite? You know, I, I, got, I got some really fierce emails uh, just a, about a month ago saying, you know, you've got all these white guys that are all, and I said, hey, they're the CEOs of all the companies that people want to hear from. What do we do about that? We got to change that. Boards, CEOs, executives, any thoughts on that? Well, start by speaking out and being angry. You know, my, my black employees and black friends tell me to pretend as if this is my son that this happened, that these awful things happened to. Uh, and then how would I feel? How outraged would I be? Um, so we have to be angry. We have to be angry and understand that 
you know, this system has, has discrimination cooked into its roots. You don't have to look any farther than looking at Zestimates from neighborhood to neighborhood uh, within cities to see systemic racism. Uh, and so speak out, it feels uncomfortable, too bad. Okay, let, let's move on to real estate, um, and it's hard, you know, with these issues. For me, like, oh, gosh, I just want to talk about this all day, but we have yeah. some other realities here that, that we should deal with and some, uh, some good news amongst a lot of different things going on. But let's move, move to the market. You have reported just recently that year-over-year year, traffic to your listings is 40% higher. Redfin came with more or less the same information. Other search portals, I think Google too. What's going on? What is going on that buyers are more active? It is because we're sitting in our living rooms like after Christmas and we have nothing else to do and we're dreaming about houses? Or does it translate into real people looking for real houses in these places? Well, I think that you can't argue with the data that, that shopping activity is really high, much higher than any of us expected. And I know everybody in the audience right now is probably seeing the same thing. And we're all kind of scratching our heads and trying to figure it out. We've done surveys uh, and talked to people to try to figure it out as well. And my theory is that, that uh, this terrible health crisis and the ensuing economic crisis that is coming on its heels is actually catalyzing a great reshuffling, uh, a great reshuffling of people. We're all reconsidering where we live, why we live there, where we work, do we want to commute, uh, do we need a home office? Um, and by the way, we're spending so much time in our homes that the relative value of home relative to every other space is much greater, obviously. It's just almost mathematical, right? Because we're spending so much time in our homes, we care a lot more. So that is, I believe what we're seeing is that's generating a lot of desire to improve the place I live, uh, which is a very natural primal human, human instinct. And I think that's what the data is saying right now, how it plays out exactly, I don't know. I'll add one thing and say, I think that that, that bubble of demand, that, that, that extra push of demand, shopping demand that we're seeing right now comes on the heels of maybe 15 years of latent pent up demand since the global financial crisis where we have not had what any of us in the industry would consider a natural rate of secondary market transactions. It's been, it's been, they've been low. We've been five and a half million secondary market transactions since the global financial crisis, which is meaningfully lower than it was in the years prior to the global financial crisis. And probably is not, it implies people wanna live in a house 18 years. That's probably not what we as humans wanna do. And so I think all of that pent up kind of tectonic pressure was building and I think this crisis is going to see an explosion of that through the surface. I think that's what we're seeing. Yeah, that, that's interesting. And let's look at a particular segment. The Wall Street Journal had an article yesterday you were quoted in, Zillow was quoted in, that a greater share of millennials have been holed up in cities than their Gen X predecessor. And in so doing, they've accumulated more wealth just during this three-month period. And that doesn't mean they're wealthy, but you know, like all of us, we're spending less money. Um, and then they use this, they juxtapose that with the average age of a Facebook employee is 29 years old. And this was shocking to me. Their median pay is $240,000. Uh, this feels like the kind of pent up demand that, you know, was kind of sitting on the sidelines really ever since the uh, great recession. And now suddenly with low rates, are we going to see, you know, did you agree with the journal? Did that, was that a right assessment? Um, and again, 240K. Per employee isn't what people in Minnesota are getting paid. Yeah, I, I that I that the source she sourced Laura Foreman with that article, and she sourced PayScale, which is a competitor to Glassdoor, which is near and dear to my heart. So I, I really have to suspect the data. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I don't really know if that data is accurate or not. I noticed she mixed the words mean and median in the same sentence, which is a flag, which is a flag for me uh, when that happens as a you know armchair statistician. Um, I think a very small portion of the demand we're seeing is that effect, 
probably, Brad. I think it has a lot more to do with all of us wanting to just improve our space, get more space. Uh, it's okay to have a longer commute because I'm going to be able to work from home uh, most of the time. That's what that's. I think a lot of companies are going to move that way. And on the on the negative side, you know, economic distress, which is upon us, it is coming. Economic distress is going to cause reshuffling as well. It may not be for the right reasons, uh, but people are going to have less resources. They're not going to be able to afford where they live. And so they're going to go looking for other places to live too. So all of this is going to create activity for, for all of us in the industry. I don't think it's going to play out over a short period of time either. I think as we all know in the industry, you know, it takes a while for the moves to actually happen. So I think we're going to see this go on for, for a while. What rich lessons did you have from, I know in 208, 209, 210, that was kind of the emergence of Zillow. You kind of dusted everybody else in terms of where to go on the internet. Um, home buying then, transactions wasn't as important to you then. It was more traffic translated into advertising, correct? Whereas now you're very transaction driven, so you have more in common with everybody on this uh, on this uh, virtual conference where you need transactions to survive every broker owner needs them every agent needs them how does this feel different for you as a company like you're you're in bed with the whole industry in a new and a different way as i say you are the transaction i yeah, it's funny i caught myself chuckling i did a um, cnbc interview on friday and i caught myself chuckling when I was describing how oh, there's all this shopping demand out there and there's not enough supply. Uh, and you know, if I could tell sellers one thing to get over their bias, they seem to have, sellers seem to have a bias that this isn't a good time to list your house. Obviously it is a good time to list your house because we have all these buyers out there and transactions are happening. And I said that to him, I said, so now is a great time to, to, to list your house. <laughs> and I laughed because I realized I sounded, I, I've, I've, I am now the, you know, a, 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 a proud member of the industry. I sounded like every other industry member that I always kind of chuckled at uh, uh, over the years. But, you know, I believe it. <laughs> uh, so I'm, you know, I'm very happy to be uh, partners with so many people in the virtual room here uh, and to be part of this industry at a time when we have a really unique opportunity to push the ball forward and to accelerate a whole bunch of long overdue, you know, technology changes and get faster to the future. You know, last week I saw a listing of yours. Uh, it was, an, I think, Oak Tree in kind of core Palm Springs near the airport. Not a, not a very affluent neighborhood. Um, and uh, I decided to go in and see it. And then I looked and traced the history. I think you guys paid seven thirty-five for this about 14 months ago as an iBuyer. It's now listed as a Zillow listing. You've now got it down to six thirty-five. That must be a dicey business, buying and selling homes, uh, particularly now. Um, I mean, your data scientists, your valuation experts must be going crazy. Like, how do you play that? It feels like some complicated derivative or something. That, you know, this is complex stuff. How is this affecting the eye buying movement? Yeah, well, that, that's not a typical price point for our Zillow offers business. I don't know that particular house. Um, but as you probably know, I know you know, we paused when, when, when this COVID thing hit early and the fog was thick, we paused our Zillow offers acquisitions because we just didn't know if the market was gonna seize up. We just didn't know if there was just gonna be no, no oil in the, in the engine, right? Um, we'd seen that happen in Wuhan, China with the ex extremely tight lockdown, the market just basically seized there. And so of course we didn't wanna be buying homes if there wasn't gonna be a market to sell them into. Subsequently, we've learned that people are finding a way to do it and do it safely. We're very lucky as an industry that density of gatherings of people is not required uh, in order to conduct transactions. And all of these kinds of inconveniences uh, that we that we overlooked pre-COVID are coming into high relief now, all of the latte transaction stuff, all of the digital transaction stuff, um, you know, the rich media and 3D shopping and virtual touring, all that stuff was a pretty heavy lift for us pre this thing. 
Uh, and now we're seeing really, really rapid adoption of that. Uh, so that's, that's fantastic. From a Zillow offers particularly side, Brad, it's just another variable in the model, you know, price uncertainty. We're seeing prices hold up. I don't know, I'm sure you've reported on this data, but prices are, prices are holding up really well. And our great econ team at Zillow doesn't predict prices are gonna come down that much, less than 2% by the end of the year. Uh, and so we're able to start safely buying homes again. We're able to start safely marketing those and showing them to people because we can clean, we can protect, and we can distance. Uh, and we're able to close things electronically. We're able to close our transactions almost mostly electronically. Uh, and so I, you know, I would, I guess I'd finally say that we believe this product might be a little bit more attractive in a world where people don't want other people through their houses too. And so I think we're seeing a little, anecdotally, we're seeing a little bit more demand from sellers to sell uh, in a more simple, in a more simple fashion as well. I call this the digital spring that came upon us kind of unexpectedly. And, uh, this technology transformation, it took a pandemic, putting the industry against, you know, against its, uh, on its heels, but to do transactions, suddenly all of this stuff had to be adopted. But I'm also kind of a critic, and this is, you know, there's the industry adopting it, which is really essential, and I think that's, you know, gone crazy, probably more in two months than two years. Um, but also we need to improve the technology. I'm still... You know, the virtual tours are a little clunky. I uh, like seeing that 360 degree thing. That was like, you just got a Zoom pop up on your screen and it's like, how do we fix all that? I have trouble getting from the kitchen to the living room on a virtual tour. And, uh, you know, maybe it's me, but uh, the innovators, the technologists here, they got to go to work. We got to make these better, smoother, easier. You know, it, it's like walking backwards with a blindfold to get from the kitchen to the living room. What, 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 are, what are you all working on to make that experience better? Everything. <laughs> Everything. We've been investing for years in a team, a rich media experiences team with incredibly bright uh, engineering and machine learning folks to be able to do things like take a regular iPhone or a regular smartphone and take a series of pictures and videos in a house and then derive a floor plan from that and derive and, uh, and on the fly create a, a virtual tour, uh, a 3D tour that um, shoppers want to uh, take via their app, uh, app or on the web. Uh, we've been working on we've been working on that. We've been working on electronic trafficking of documents. We've been working on digital mortgages um, and digital title uh, and escrow closing. Um, so everything, you know. I guess I would liken it, Brad. Imagine how much R and D resource right now is going into a better video conferencing system now, a better work from home, the, all the, imagine Zoom, Zoom kind of zo has zoomed way ahead, but imagine the resource that's going at, on at Microsoft and Facebook and Google right now and, and, and startups uh, coming at doing what we're doing now radically better. We know it can be done a lot better. We're experiencing these frustrations really for the first time because it wasn't that important, not for us. I know you guys have been work from home for a while, but, but for most of the working world, this is a new experience. And so this is the same for the real estate industry. All these things are new experiences and we are now zooming ahead all, as, a, as a whole industry. Everybody's focused on this and I'm, I'm very optimistic that we're going to get uh, digital spring. I don't know if it's going to all happen by spring, but I get, I get what you're saying. I, I like the concept. We got three weeks. So we're, you know, you just got three weeks to get it all together for us. Okay, Rich. Okay. That's, that's the, beginning. Well, that's the end that. of spring. Did you hear okay. that, David? Hey, David, let me. Uh, David Vitelli, are you listening? <laughs> Come on, David, get going. Um, Come on. Yaz, my wife. My Yaz, my wife has a question for you. She's a she's a power user of uh, Zillow and Redfin, and she's amazed by the algorithms and the learning of her behavior. And suddenly, she searches all over all the time, and uh, she noticed that just recently she's seen a plethora of reduced pricing. The little red, I think you have a little red tab. Um, it's showing, and it seems like that's all they're giving her. And I think the machine has determined Yas is looking for deals. I don't know how, I don't know if she is, 
Uh, I know we're not signing any contracts, but what do you think, uh, what, what is happening there? I mean, that sounds like a powerful feature for the consumer, because I know buyers are thinking now they can get deals. Uh, it sounds like you're saying prices are holding up and they can't. I hear this from all of our, all of our community. There isn't really any deals out there yet. But what is the algorithm doing? That's Yaz's question for you, Rich. Well, I mean, there's brute force filtering on price drops, you know, um, so that so that from a notification perspective, if you want to see when price drops uh, happen, that we send an alert via various uh, uh, alert mechanisms. Uh, additionally, we can intuit that you know from your shopping behavior. Uh, that you are looking for certain kinds of things, um, and we all we're merchandisers now, just like everybody in the industry, and we know that motion and action creates uh, draws the eye and creates interest. And you know, the more we can draw the eye and measure interest by engagement, the more we'll we'll do that. Um, you know, that sounds very robotic and scary, but it's really not. It's just basically giving people trying to to read people's minds through their clicks and through their actions in order to give them a more personalized product, which is, which is what people want. And that's, we're only at the very beginning there, um, Brad, we're, we're, you know, we've got a long, long way to go. Uh, but luckily we're in a hugely advantaged position at Zillow. We're lucky that we get so much signal. So the machine gets smarter. Machine learning works better the more data that's coming in and we get hundreds Million, hundreds of millions of signal a day from consumers because they vote with their clicks. And as the machine gets smarter, we can make the machine more personal. That's what's going on. One area that I want to just explore quickly is the iBuying responsibility you have. Behind you guys, all the iBuyers, is Wall Street. And Wall Street and Main Street have never gotten along too well. And you could arguably say, you know, Wall Street funds entrepreneurs and innovation. So I'm not putting down the whole concept. But in real estate, they're there in the beginning and they're there during, you know, the disasters. And, you know, some of this forbearance could turn into foreclosures. As you've said, the employment picture is an unknown. How do you be a good citizen here? Because you're kind of an instrument of Wall Street here. And the last thing we need, if the government you know, and the banks decide not to extend forbearance, we're going to have foreclosures. And I'd hate to see you know, Wall Street snap up properties again and put people out. And what, what's your, you know, what's, as a, a real estate citizen here, how do you protect against that? Brad, don't try to make me an instrument of Wall Street. I'm not an instrument of Wall Street. If I'm an instrument of Wall Street, the whole industry is an instrument of Wall Street because every mortgage, that, just about every mortgage that's out there is packaged up into giant mortgage bundles and sold to huge pools of capital around the world, including Wall Street, kind of facilitated by Wall Street. Uh, that is all we're doing at, at, at Zillow as well with, with Zillow offers in particular, which I think, which I, I, I think you're talking about. Um, the investment, real estate as an investment, a mortgage as an investment uh, with some notable exceptions that we're all keenly aware of uh, has been a terrifically desirable investment from the deepest pools of capital in the world. And that will not change. There is a ton of capital in the world that's sitting in these deep pools. And those pools of capital do want exposure to real estate in the United States via these great big bundles of mortgages or whatever other mechanisms that that uh, very smart Wall Street people come up with. Uh, and so we're all a part of that. Um, I think that that um, having regular from a regulatory perspective, making sure we're not introducing systemic risk into the system is critical. And I will tell you that this crisis feels a lot different from the last one, does it not? It, and it does yeah, because, because we learned, we did learn from the last one, you know, the, the, the secondary market for mortgages for, for, for home, they, it basically seized in in 2008 uh, and it just hasn't done that it has barely blinked there was a little bit of a servicing crisis early on but it has barely blinked uh, and that is due to the industry getting a lot smarter i think we are a more robust industry now than we were then 
Fair, and we need liquidity. We need liquidity in the real estate market, um, but we also have to be on guard here, and I guess that's my challenge to you. And I guess the overall, um, I think one thing that I, I feel about what you guys have done is you're now kind of the unchallenged leader uh, in a way that's quite amazing. Congratulations, it points to your success. Uh, but you look at your market cap today, um, it's staggering. Uh, I think you got about two and a half billion dollars worth of liquidity, cash, cash equivalents in the bank. Um, you're in a perfect position to lead and you're probably the unparalleled leader here. Um, so I don't think I have to tell you, but I would constantly challenge you to do more <laughs> and do better. And I think particularly now, because we have a bundle of issues before us, and I think, uh, as I always say, we got to dig deep and reach high, um, because suddenly the political, the social, the economic issues. Uh, we have a writer, Teresa Boardman, who said to me the other day, she's in the heart of it, uh, just trying to get along and survive in Minneapolis, and she said our institutions have failed us, and um, I don't. I think there's a lot of signs of that. You know, a lot of signs of our institutions failing us. So my challenge to you, Zillow is the single largest institution in real estate. Um, one, we don't want you to fail, and we also want you to lead, which I know you will. Any last words for the Inman community, Rich? And uh, thank you uh, again for always being present. The community, uh, um, you're, you're controversial at times, but most people in the industry love what you're doing and, and uh, uh, support what you're doing and depend on you. Thanks, th thanks, Brad. I guess I, I would close by saying we're lucky to be a part of this great industry. We are. We love this industry. It's important. We have learned this crisis has highlighted to all of us just how primally kind of bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs shelter is the core shelter, food, safety. We are fundamental to people and so important to people. And we take that very seriously. We have from the start focused on the homeowner, the customer to try to build a better experience and a better um, a better product and a better service for those customers. And from the beginning as well, we have used uh, uh, technology and our privileged position with the customer to pitch a big tent, as big a tent as possible with partners in the industry who are of a like mind to focus on the customer so that the customer experience is better and who understand how technology can make that happen and who wanna partner with us. So I thank I thank all the partners out there. I really feel like we are intertwined with the industry. We are working hard to be a really positive force in the industry. Uh, and I think this crisis affords us all an opportunity to lock arms and to fix a bunch of stuff in the industry uh, uh, that needs fixing because customers' expectations for safety today will become their demand to, uh, post COVID and we, and, and we can all lock, our, lock arms and, and, and get there. Thanks, thanks for having me, Brad. Thanks everyone at, the, at this new style conference. Well said, Rich, and thank you again so much. Uh, uh, gang, I'm gonna pass it back to Katie and uh, we'll be back on here in just a few minutes. Thank you. Hi, everybody, um, and thank you, Brad and Rich. Uh, let's talk about summer, because uh, as we all know, summer is going to be very different this year than it has in the past. So coming up, we have some great speakers to talk about essentials for summer 2020. How do you turn your clients into lifelong fanatics? Partner with Utility Concierge to give them something to rave about even after closing. They'll love telling their friends you gave them a personal concierge to set up all of their utilities and home services in one quick phone call. You'll love that Utility Concierge fits right into your process, engages your clients for you, and gives you all the credit. Your buyers will have everything they need for move-in, you'll look like a rock star, and we get to work with amazing partners. We call that a win-win-win. the culture and the people that is Psy. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Here you're talking about heavy hitters across the country. They're going after the cream of the crop. 
you understand that you're part of something bigger. We want to help each other, and the collaboration is amazing. I have other top producers that are part of Side that are their own brands and businesses, and then we network together. You have the ability to network with the best of the best. To be around that set of greatness will make everybody better. And this is going to be a little different, this panel. Uh, I think it's time for old white guys to move over and give the stage to the leaders of the industry that should be, in my opinion, right now, maybe they, not maybe, they should be running the industry. So instead of me talking and gabbing, you already heard my opening speech. You always already heard one interview. Uh, I'm literally going to pass it off to three people, that, uh, one who I've just gotten to know. We had her in the town hall, Tiffany Curry, who's a broker owner of Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, the first female African-American broker owner. Do I have that right, Tiffany? Uh, first African-American owner, period, in the world. Fantastic. And Ann and Veronica are longtime members of the Inman community. Um, love them both. They're amazing. Veronica runs a team uh, with EXP Realty, and Ann Jones runs is a broker owner with Windermere Adobe. We got good geographical. We're all over the country today with these three, but I really meant what I said. I think it's time guys like me move over and we, you're in charge and I trust you and just go for it. The title is Essentials for Getting Ahead in Summer 2020, but I think it's about health. I think it's about human rights. I think it's about a faltering economy. That's my setup and, you know, jump in where you would like and I'm going to do very little moderating. Is that okay with you three? That is. Yeah. Who wants to start? We had a great conversation warming up for this. Us three ladies got together and had a, had a little dialogue because, frankly, you could have sent us talking points last week and they would have been irrelevant this week. I mean, I think that's, a, that's the reality of where we're at right now. So we had some time to connect and talk about uh, what's our path forward right now and you know, the rest of the year and moving forward as um, leaders, female leaders in this business. Ladies, you feel like uh, we, we, got pretty, we got pretty deep in our time and we only have a little time here, but what do you feel like are the things that uh, we really want to take forward from our conversation? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in, Ann, and I appreciate you being such an amazing leader and, and an advocate for just speaking the truth, being raw. And Brad, thank you for opening up like that. You know, I think it's time for change. Um, I think it's, it's very true that there is very little representation in leadership with diversity. Um, and it's time to reposition the playing field. And um, Tiffany's an amazing representation and having a, you know, experience also things regarding being a biracial couple who runs um, a brokerage that not a lot of people look like. Myself being a Hispanic woman um, and, and I would say shattering some, some glass ceilings that we want to see more representation. Um, in our industry, in leadership, and having a voice, and what's tolerated, what's not tolerated, and not feeling like we have to, you know, hide behind what you know others people others would perceive as acceptable in this industry. Um, it's time to step up as leaders. I, I was sharing with Tiffany and Anne prior to this, Brad, that when I was starting my team and when I was starting my brokerage, I contemplated changing my last name and changing the name on my door because I didn't think. People would respect me as a broker. People would join my team if I was too Hispanic or I wasn't, I didn't fit the status quo. 
And that was 10 years ago. And I'll never forget someone who told me, never change who you are and lead, just show up as a leader. And there was a limited belief that I had to appear to be different and fit in. And I'm so glad I didn't. And here we are 10 years later. And hopefully we can help other people continue and step up into leadership and dare to be themselves. Well, I, I want to piggyback on that, what Veronica said, because, of course, she and Ann and I had a great conversation before, which is almost a session by itself. Um, but I understood and I related to Veronica a lot when she said about naming her company, um, because I went back, I shared with the ladies, I actually went back five times on the name of my company, and we actually turned around and called it NameGate, um, because we were, we were encouraged to call it something other than my name, but... For if people that know me know me best know that this opportunity for me wasn't just about making money, it was about leaving a legacy and it was about creating something that other future leaders and future children can grow up and aspire to one day. And that for me was the greatest gift that I could give. And for that reason, I looked at the Houston real estate market and I know for a fact that our top three companies are named after people. They do over $7 billion a year in real estate and they've been consistent. And what people, and I've talked to different generations and I think in different races of people and what they all told me when I put the names in front of them, particularly the younger generation was that we like your name, um, not because it's your name, but because it is your name. And what that means is to them, it showed that person could be honest, that person had great character, because who's going to name something after themselves if they're if they, if they have something to hide? And I think that's that's a really big thing. I think for us, it's important to create a space for diversity um, within the industry. And as I shared with the ladies, you know, being a woman is one thing. Being a, a woman of color is another thing. For me, the biggest pushback I've gotten my whole career has been my age. People have looked at me and saw that I was pretty much a millennial, and that's where things stopped. So people just looked at me and de they decided up front what category they were going to put me in or how well they were going to respect me based off how old they thought that I was. So I am excited to join this panel today because I feel like it's going to create a lot of conversation that needs to be had and people that need to be viewed differently. And that that was one of our takeaways when we were chatting was about like the you've got to cut the crap and call it out as you see it that I think it's something that I mean, amongst us and generationally, the generations coming forward in this business, I mean, they need to talk about what's going on. They want to talk about what's going on. They want to have leaders who are going to address it. Um, and, you know, the things we were discussing that these are delicate issues, but you cannot not talk about it uh, within your organization, within your community. I mean, people are looking to us for leadership and it is challenging. It's supposed to be challenging. Like the stuff we're all grappling with right now is not easy, but it impacts uh, what we do professionally in such a profound way. You know, we're talking about people's homes and their livelihood. We've, we've got to be in these dialogues, I think. How do we do that? You know, We talked about the sensitivity within your community, some of the populations that you're working with. How do we do that and still maintain those relationships? Like each of you have a strong relationship with your local police departments, right? And we were saying that that's a that's a tough spot to be in right now, but there is a right way to carry that conversation forward. How do you see that being? Well, I think I'll take that one and I'll start with that because I will just touch what's going on in the world right now. I know a lot of people, and this is a conversation that we had earlier, a lot of people are open to that conversation now. Um, and the reason why is because we have visuals of like what's happening. So to see things on the news is one thing, but to actually see video of some of the things that are happening and it shows you why this is such an importance and it really has a lot of people including white people now i'm seeing more and more just are like you know what what is going on it's different races of people that are looking at this and saying wow this is what's going on um, for us here in Houston, it's a big deal because we have a police chief that we highly respect and a police department that we just love. And what's been amazing for us is seeing those the police chief and the police department on the ground walking with the protesters and showing them the right way to do things. I think that's huge, especially because the, um, the victim in question, Mr. George Floyd, is from Houston, Texas. And not only it hits home for me because his high school, Jackie Yates Senior High, is also my high school. 
Um, I grew up in the same area. My parents graduated from the same high school. Um, we have cousins in that high school now. And so it's a big deal for us. But I think the conversations that we have to have, and similar to a video I saw this morning as I'm um, seeing a lot of different things. We saw protesters being arrested this morning in different states. And on one of the one of the pe people that were being arrested, um, the first police guy, he put his knee on his neck. And the first thing we saw was the, the, the rest of the protesters call it out. And we saw the other police that was handcuffing him push the, the other police officer's knee off the guy's neck. He didn't move it at the first time. So he hit it again and he pushed it off. I think that's a big deal because I think we don't want in society, and, and these are tough conversations that we have to have, with the police protect and serve our communities. And they are not the bad guys. It's just like in real estate. You don't, all realtors are not bad. You're just gonna have some bad apples in the bunch. And it's just like with our brokerages that we talked about earlier, when we recognize that we have bad apples, we have to remove them. And I think that's what it comes down to so that they don't spoil the whole thing. But we have we have all too often seen people not wade into these topics. We were talking about uh, affordable housing, for example, you know, a subject that sometimes gets danced around because maybe it's not the desired uh, price band for a lot of people in their markets. And and yet we're seeing leaders, and we talked about a few, address that within the industry. I mean, we're seeing these issues that for a long time could have been pushed off as impacting someone else come come home. I mean, it's one of the things about. Uh, for better or worse, the advent of a video everywhere and social media is that these are issues that impact all of us. People are just, I think, finally willing to acknowledge that. Um, and so, Veronica, we were talking about at, at home for you. I mean, you have an incredibly diverse brokerage. You live in a diverse community, um, you know, navigating some of these conversations. And are you finding, you know, this next week, this, uh, the rest of this year, will this change how you're moving forward with your folks? I think that our office is a unique office because we've always promoted diversity. We've always been known as a diverse bunch, right? But as Brad named this panel, like, you know, how are we preparing for the future? I think a lot of brokers now are going to not only prepare on safety in the office, COVID safety, right? All these new changes, but now even trying to promote, hey, we are diverse. I think a lot of these offices are now going to try to catch up and say, hey, we, you know, we, we promote diversity or we have a... Um, a SOP or a protocol in place where when an agent is determining if they're going to go show a home, the first thing they're asking is, what's the price point or is it within my respective desired price point and or what community is it in? Is that going to play a, pe a part of, you know, going against affordable housing or truly representing, you know, all different walks of life of clients, which Brad, you did an amazing job in New York when you brought on that panel where they did the research on how discrimination and redlining still exists and steering, um, is, it, it, that study was amazing. And I think um, a lot of brokerages probably don't have something in place where if it's not within the right price point or the desired price point of that agent, at what point is it where we aren't giving people a fair shot at, at home ownership or um, affordable housing? Um, so I don't know. Uh, I could say that we're very proud what we do with our team because we are very price agnostic and, you know, we, we try to represent everyone from all walks of life. But I think brokers really need to take a good look inside because the, the comment, the theme that Anne and Tiffany and I were talking, that brokers have this belief that, well, they're independent contractors. We can't tell them what to do. Well, that's right. But you know what? If you're going to be part of our team and our culture and represent the uh, our mission, then there is zero tolerance for discrimination and and steering people and or not treating people fair just because it doesn't fit your price point. So we have to determine how we're going to fix that internally. And there seems to be an openness, I mean, a, a willingness right now, and I don't know how long it's going to last, but this openness to learn, to understand, you know, people who said, but I mean, uh, housing, you know, discriminating uh, prote against protected classes is against the law. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen, right? I mean, the the desire to understand what's impacting everyone, the desire to understand what's driving um, the collective rage of the protesters out there. I mean, people seem more open to learning, and that includes learning about our industry's impact uh, on these communities around the country. Um, it seems like there's a desire there. And so as leaders, we have this opportunity to step into that and hold these conversations. We talked about as 
female leaders that we may be well suited to oversee these dialogues? Do either of you want to touch on that? I mean, just from your experiences? Well, I think as a, as a woman in real estate, I think, you know, of course, we are a large part of the real estate community. But of course, I know in a lot of leadership circles, as we discussed, it's very limited, even with um, our national presidencies um, and even within within the world. But I'll go ahead and stick to, to real estate. Um, it, I think it's a big deal because as women, I think and we touched it a little bit. I think we have to remember that sometimes we're our biggest critics. You know, and we touched this where as being a woman in business, especially a woman in leadership, um, other women may treat us different because we are women. I think the first thing is that we have to recognize that and and learn how to treat one another. Um, I think that's a big thing. And we have to have that same level of respect for a woman that we have for a man. And I think that's that's a that's a really telling feature. Um, you know, I am about four and a half months in as a brokerage and I share it with the ladies, you know, um, you know, people have come into my company and we have welcomed them wholeheartedly. Um, and we've actually been a lot more generous to them than they have seen at some male dominated brokerages. But at the same time, when they look at my age and when they look at me as being a woman, you know, they feel like they don't have to offer me the same level of respect. And so as a female leader, I say it's important for we as women to take that respect and carve out that niche for ourselves, because that's the only way we turn the page. Veronica, I love what you said about the uh, super bright male team members on, on your team. You're obviously very proud of your team when you speak about them. You were talking about the uh, monster month that you just had and how exciting that was. Yeah, I, I think that um, it, it's something to be proud of when very intelligent men will believe in your vision and mission and, and, and will be part of your leadership team. I have a vice president of operations and we just brought on a, um, a very, very important role as well, a database manager who has a math uh, a, a mathematician algorithm, a degree, I don't know, something fancy. But, you know, we just, Brad, we just celebrated 100 homes in the month of May executed. Um, something I would have never, you know, would have even fathomed. We wrote as a small, humble team, a hundred uh, contracts in what would have, we would have believed would have been probably impossible during COVID. But it's because we are a collective group of professionals working together. And I have men who work with me and for me and are part of my leadership team, where oftentimes when it's a woman in leadership or women brokerages, it's believed that only women will work for them. And I think that's another misconception, which I think needs to, needs to, we need to debunk that. And, and Brad, I'm always so grateful for what you've done for my career and how you recognize diversity and people being different and going against the status quo. I mentioned to the ladies, you know, in 2017, when we won the most innovative team of the year, you know, there was a lot of backlash on our affiliation and partnership with helping with the iBuyer movement. And, you know, there were very hateful, mean comments that were made on forums like, Oh, Zillow's new puppet, or and they said it with bad words, or you know, she's a welfare agent. You know, if it would have been a man, would they have been progressive, or would they have been considered innovative? But because it was a woman in diversity, she's considered a welfare agent or someone who can't go out there and build because they didn't know me or know what I had already built, the framework that I had built to build a career. Um, it the, the it has to change. This has to change because women are so capable of being in leadership. Minority women strong women, women who are, you know, again, you know, Anne is, runs an amazing brokerage, her and her husband, and, and, and just diversity is so welcome. Had that been someone else, I wonder what, it, what the comments would have been. But I'm so proud that you stand up for diversity as well, Brad. So thank you for that, because um, you are leading the path in that. Um, and here we are three years later, and now it's not an uncommon theme to talk about iBuyers, right? Right. And it's kind of that reminder that, I mean, in this moment, um, maybe as an opportunity for everybody to take a hard look at their, you know, their business plans, their brokerages, and consider what a successful realtor looks like, um, consider what a successful manager or an owner, and maybe reevaluate that, because I think the generation that's coming is looking for something different. And I mean, they're facing this head on, they are facing this moment head on. Um, I know certainly our children, I've had some pretty enlightening conversations with our, our kids. And I mean, their awareness of what's happening at 10 and 14 um, is they're, they're there. I mean, they're paying attention. And so 
this is a really good opportunity for people when they're reflecting on like, what do we do now? What's our path forward at this moment? Maybe it's time to reevaluate, you know, who you work with and who you're serving and be sure that you're really living up to those things that you've put on your mission statement somewhere. And I think it's, I hope to see some of that. Well, I definitely think that's a big deal. And you and um, touch something that I think is huge and has always been a part of my career are the different generations. I think a lot of times people have always talked about the Gen Y and the Gen X and things like that. But now you're seeing in addition to Gen Y and we're seeing it in our country right now is the evolution of Gen Z. It's that next generation that's coming in behind the Y generation and they have a completely different mindset. If you know, if you thought Gen Y had a mindset, now look at the next generation coming behind that one. And what we have to recognize is those people are going to be our consumers. And one of the things that I love to do in, in my brokerage, as far as planning, and that I've always just done in business, is future casting. I, I've always believed that you have to future cast your destiny, and that preparation and recognizing what this industry will look like five to 10 years from now, I think is huge. You know, for me, I'm on a, I have a 10 year franchise agreement. And so I have an actual 15 year plan. And what I see in that plan, Gen Z is a part of that plan because I know that they're gonna be active. And then as we talked and discussed, um, the Hispanic community is a huge part of my business plan for my company because in the state of Texas, over 50% of the buyers will be from the Hispanic community. And what I recognize, even though that's not my demographic, it is my responsibility. And I say that again, it's my responsibility as a broker and as a major brokerage, because I need to put pe the right people in place that are gonna provide these people with the right service, professionalism, and honesty. Because that's a big thing that we talked about a little earlier, is that they're being serviced, but they are, because they don't speak the language or because um, they don't really understand, they're not necessarily being taken proper care of, they're being taken advantage of. And so for me to be able to recognize that, I hope and I encourage other brokerages across the United States that you need to identify with where that um, area is in your market that needs to be properly serviced. And I think that's huge for us going forward because we're looking at generations that are in our future because these are the people that are going to be buying buying real estate and for the baby boomers and the gen xers that are going to be wanting to sell in the future gen y's that will be selling this is the market share so we need to pay attention to that so i i get really excited about that demographic because i feel like a lot of people it goes unnoticed um but i think it's it's the right time for us to have these conversations and i think that as um real estate people in addition to women and minorities we do need to pay a diff pay attention to the different generations because nobody really wants to talk about that it's like the forgotten about secret but these are people, these are real people, and they're very headstrong and opinionated. And we need to address that animal now because, you know, if we want a business going forward as far as the future of real estate, we have to consider these changes. And they're going to call out your BS, right? Like they're not going to stand for, that generation is not going to stand for it. And even if you don't want to do it because uh, it's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. you, you might as well put your business plan and say you're going to have to do it at some point in time. Mm -hmm. Brad, we we uh, we had a long dialogue here. I don't know if this is what you, when you sent out questions for us. I don't know where you thought this was uh, going to go, but we decided this was a conversation that needed to continue in our chat. Well, I'm going to. I hope it does. I hope it can. Th this was fantastic, and uh, the fact you were just respectful of time of our audience is something a guy wouldn't have done. He would have blathered on about. Not all guys. It's not all of us, but um, that alone. And there's so many lessons in this. Um, I'm glad we did it this way, and I would like to give you and others in the Inman community more authority of Inman, you know, more responsibility. Uh, I think we're good at diversity on the stage and our editorial team and our editorial coverage, but I think this is a profound moment. We've got to do more. We've got to step higher and do more. So I'm going to invite you to help me um, help us do even more things we haven't thought of because we're in a great position with all the readers we have to make a difference here. So. Um, I love that we did this. I love stepping back. I may call on you in the next three days, if you're willing, and plug you in uh, where others are. But in the meantime, this was a great conversation. And I was given a time limit, but I said, let's just see. I think the conversation will 
go as long as it needs to, but we've only begun to scratch the surface. And you all hit on some really great issues. So I'm very grateful to all of you. And glad I got to know you more, Tiffany. And welcome back, always, Veronica and Anne. And uh, let's spend the whole week stirring up the real estate industry, OK, together, and so we can get back on track. And I'm going to talk to all these CEOs that are white guys. What's your succession plan? Let's, let's put some candidates in place. So uh, when they step out, let's make sure boards, CEOs, you know, that's just the beginning, but it, it's an important first step. And it's part of what my speech was about. Anyway, I think, did we cover it? Any last words from any of you? Thank you so much. Let's make a difference. Talk soon. Bye-bye. This is Brad Inman checking out. It's never been a more exciting or challenging time to be a real estate agent. This is why CoreLogic has created the future of client service with One Home. While other companies design technology solutions to automate the transaction and remove the agent from that relationship, CoreLogic does the opposite. One Home now becomes your shared collaboration portal as you and your client search for that perfect home. Visit onehome.com to see why there's no place like One Home. The saying holds true, you get what you pay for. You can get produce from a 99 cent store, but do you? If you only get this much of a system versus Boomtown that's got all of this, what is this margin going to cost you at the end of the day? And so the reason you should list with me is I'm going to put the most money in your pocket. Even though I might charge more, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much I charge, it's about how much goes in your pocket. And so we got to stay focused on that and use a system that's going to put the most money possible in your pocket. Welcome back. I think one of my greatest memories of Inman or one of my favorite ever interviews was Gary Keller and Brad Inman a few years ago. If you were there in person, you did not forget it. It was amazing. So let's see if we can recreate today with a vision for the real estate industry uh, in the future with our beloved Brad, along with Gary Keller and Josh Team. to have Gary Keller and Josh team. Are we live here, team? I think so. Gary, are you there? Oh, yeah, I'm not here. Yes. Oh, how are you today? Looks like there's a uh, delay between me talking and my face on your screen, Brad. <laughs> The good news is, Gary, that the audience can't see the delay. It's just you and I. So what we should pretend is that you're the editor of, let's say, the New York Times, and I'm a reporter in Afghanistan. So that's the gotcha. delay. Or you're in a television gotcha. producer. But the audience can't see what you and I are experiencing. But okay. for my mouth, it's probably good I get a delay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, Gary, really good to have you. And Josh, really good to have you, too. Um, Thank you. you know, Gary, we build this, you know, in marketing as another sparring match between you and me. But I think the last thing, and I know you would agree, we need right now is another fight in the industry or in the world. And I think yeah. you and I, most people don't know, you and I stay in touch and communicate. And I think we, we both agree, you know, we've got to all work together right now uh, more than ever. So for those that were expecting us to uh, try to beat each other up, I have no interest in doing that. And I know you don't either, Gary, right? Not at all. And how are you doing? Everything good down in Austin? It is, right? It's um, sobering times, right? So it's, um, you know, let me just make this statement for me personally, Brad, and that is, you know, I woke up this morning and I went, you know, I'm extremely humbled by the things that are going on. And, um, I, and, and I realized something about myself 
and that is, you know, I, I'm 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 not a racist, and I'm not a person who discriminates. But I woke up this morning, and and realized that just being that way is no longer enough, right? And 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 I realized that. Uh, from this moment on, I, I'm forever changed by these events that I, I have to be anti-discrimination. I have to be anti-racism. I can't just be not it anymore, right? And I think that's the, the, the most interesting thing that's going on in the world right now is, is that, right? Yeah, I think there's a profound duty that we have as leaders now to not just, it's like our stage, not just have representation, but do, to do even more. And I think you just said it very that's well. Right. Uh, yeah, that's we right. have to become have to be activists. You know, when that last panel ended, the audience didn't get to see it, but Anne took her camera and pointed it outside to a protest. And mm -hmm. her declaration was, you know, that's what this is about, you know, and it was a peaceful protest, but the point was people are standing up and screaming and they're angry, and I think um, it's That's about right. time. Um, it is a And we really should spend the, and we really should spend all the 45 minutes maybe on that, but we're not going to. And uh, yeah. um, I think that we also have real estate business at hand. There's people that are tuning in here to get your wisdom and insight. Um, you and I talked ahead of time about some areas that I thought you could deliver. And I think you've always had a good sense of what's around the bend. I was reminded this morning by a listener um, when we were together how profoundly accurate you were at the time you were on the Inman stage the last time. And so I think that one area that I think you could really help us with, you and Josh, is what will the real estate industry look like on the other side of COVID-19. And it may be part of some of the issues of the last week, but yeah. COVID turned the tables on us all. If you guys could just, and I'm just gonna give you the mic this time, and I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna ask you to stand up or sit down. Uh, I'd just like to give it to you, because I know people really wanna hear what you have to say. There you go. Um, well, go to it, you guys. Kind. Well, you're very kind. Um, and, and Josh, uh, 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 jump in and, and, and I'll just lead us off. Here, here's what I think. What I think is, is that um, we see three major things going on. And then I want to talk about who I think the winners are. Uh, the first thing that we see, we're seeing is just a true fast track of disruption, right? What, what, what was going to take, easily going to take uh, five years, seven years, maybe even, uh, you know, 10 years, Brad, uh, it is now collapsing. It's all it's all packed in, and um, uh, it's we're we're now we're now looking at probably 18 months, less than two years for all the things that might have taken up to a decade to happen. It, it's all collapsing, right? And um, here, I, I'm going to stand up for a second, but it, it's just for a second, right? I actually pulled my. Uh, and by the way, welcome to my office. This is this is actually my my office. Um, but, and I, I, I put this on the, the screen, uh, uh, when we met last and this is what I wrote. Hey Gary, can you move your computer over or can the audience see it? How about that? There you go. Thanks a lot. Perfect. And, you know, just for the fun of it, I wish I had my camera could move around, Brad. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have eight flip charts in my office. <laughs> so, <laughs> so lot, anyway, guys. I know, I know, I know, I know. It's, hey, can you it's, step back? Just take two steps back really quick. You're a little too close. Sorry. There you go. Okay. Perfect. There you go. Okay. So, so here's, here, to me, this is the fundamental truth. And, 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 and what I, and I believe we do this um, without putting a name to it. So maybe by putting a name to this or giving it some sort of a, of a description, it helps all of us um, make better decisions or smarter or faster decisions going forward. So here's the, here's the way, here's why I look at it. And I think this is what's going on. And that is every day physically based businesses wake up. I'm going to come back. They wake up. And they ask this question, 
What's the least I have to do digitally to protect my physical based business? Now, here's the problem with that. And that is digitally based businesses wake up every day and they ask the question, what's the least I can do in the physical space to kick your digital butt? And the, the outside real estate examples are, are you know, uh, uh, pretty obvious to us, right? Uh, this was Barnes and Noble and this was um, Amazon. And the truth is, is that Barnes and Noble had warehouses in every major city. B Barnes and Noble, at one point, the, the Nook was better than the Kindle. And yet they weren't committed to this. They were asking the question, what's the least we have to do? What's the least? Can you see that? What's the, what's the least yeah. that we have to do? in order here to just keep business the way it is. And here's the point is business is not going to be the way it was. And just because, and I'll say this about the pandemic too, just because we're going to have a new normal, it doesn't mean that it's worse, right? It, it doesn't mean that at all. When I, you know, I got in the real estate business in 79, interest rates went to 18%. In fact, uh, Mindy, uh, uh, one of my amazing uh, partners in business, Mindy tells me that her parents had, she didn't even know this, had a 21% mortgage. Now let's just medicate on that for a second. 21%, right? Uh, and I got in that business and man, everywhere you turn, the, the, all the experienced agents were just sitting around and they were saying, well, nobody will buy or sell real estate during this period. Um, and we're just gonna wait till it gets back to normal. And it never got back to normal. And I don't believe any of those people stayed in the business that long. So here, here's, here's my premise. The, 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 the premise that I'm trying to make uh, in this conversation is that this, this right here, this is the basis of all conversation. And so the first point is that um, we're seeing a fast track of disruption. And um, a good way to think about that is, is how you and I are, are talking right now. Normally, uh, we'd have been sitting on stools uh, next to each other and uh, the, uh, there would be an, a live audience. And instead, um, we've been forced to not do that right now. And, you know, it, it, and this, is the, and this, is, this becomes the second point, and that is uh, not only seeing a collapse, a collapse of the speed at which a disruption is going to occur. But number two, we're, we're seeing a, a change in behavior. Um, I wrote a book about this, right? The, that the research says it takes 66 days to actually, ch uh, on average, uh, to change a behavior. And I think we're past 66 days. And uh, what we're beginning to see already is how people use space and how they use uh, technology is, is beginning to change. Uh, again, it's this, we were, we were all physically based and we were, we were thinking of technology as something that enhanced our physical space. And I think what's happened immediately, I can speak for the agents that I work with across the globe. They're now digitally based and they're doing physical enhancement, right? They're, they're making buyer, um, consultations via zoom or Google hangouts. Um, they're doing open houses. Uh, through Facebook Live, they're right, and then they're asking the question: Do we need to go physical, and what will that look like? So we're 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 seeing an absolute change um, in in behavior, and a lot of people keep thinking, well, we're going to go back, but man, we're not going back, I mean, and I don't even know if we want to go back. Uh, uh, right, we we don't want to. Um, I left the house this morning. Um, where I have a, an office and my wife, my wife says, um, and the dog too, by the way, go, um, man, we're going to miss you because, you know, I, I've been working in my office every day and, um, we built, we built new habits. We built new, um, gosh, new relationships, by the way, uh, that, uh, or built our relationships in different ways. Uh, it's not going to go back. It's it's not going to go back. And the third one is strategic alliances, uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, we're going to see that we're going to see that speed up, and we're going to see it number one speed up because of necessity. And that is, look, we 
we got a lot of things going on, right? It's like the perfect storm. You have a pandemic, which turns into an economic crisis, and then we have a moral crisis, right? And you 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 look up and you go, man, this is um, uh, this is a problem. And a lot of people ask me. I mean, again, the statistics. You you have agents right now, and and a lot of brokerages are at this point having their best year ever right literally their best year ever and they're scratching their head and i get the i get the the questions all the time i get the email and the text daily saying man what am i supposed to make about this and you go well we do understand that we have a an immense shortage of real estate that was a decade in the making right that's for sale and it's not getting fixed anytime soon which by the way is contributing to pin up demand because you don't have the inventory, which is also turning into uh, higher prices, uh, right? We're continuing to see um, uh, inflationary uh, uh, gains for home prices, which uh, that creates its own set of problems, right? So we, we're, we're going to see this. We're going to see it in software. We're going to see it in vendors. We're going to see it uh, with brokerages. We're going to see it with agents. We're going to see We're going to see new alliances. We're going to see um, partnershiping that might have looked like strange bedfellows yesterday and today seems to totally make sense. So that's kind of my, my, my overview of what I, what I think is actually happening, right? We're going to fast track disruption, which is already, which is absolutely happening. Uh, we're going to see behavior change that doesn't go back, Brad, and we're going to see strategic alliances and partnerships and mergers and acquisitions that we might have thought not would have happened or should have happened. But all of a sudden, people are looking up and they're going, you know what? This all of a sudden makes really good sense. Gary, can I ask now, you a quick question in here? Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes, I please. love what you said here. I think you nailed it. And I think uh, what I like here, and you know me, I like to be, I can get Pollyannish think the world is a beautiful place. But what I see happening here is a lot of people have been talking about, I call it the digital spring, this renaissance. Yeah. And arguably, different than two years ago, we had all these innovators talking about the digital streamlined transaction. And what you're saying is now the rest of the industry, because it's one big tent, right, is moving yeah. over to that digital area. Yes. And I expect a lot more cooperation, a lot less fighting, and maybe we'll yes. realign turf and territory, and maybe that comes through yep. the partnerships. Because I saw the partnerships as a magnitude even a step up, where suddenly we're all in this together for this digital future. And that's just music to my ears, to hear you say that. Yeah, I think that's totally right. I think that um, the, the, um, the, all, all the barriers are down. All, all, all of that is down here. But here's the let's keep going with this. Josh, just jump in anytime you want. The um, the here, here. Here's where I OK, let's translate this into winners and losers. OK, so here's what I think, Brad. I think that, number one, um, the tech enabled consumer wins. And I think they're the biggest winner of them all in the in this. And rightfully so, they should be. Notice I said the tech enabled agent and I mean tech enabled consumer. Sorry. And what I mean by that is there, we're going to see, and this is what's, this is what's being compressed, this is what's being fast-tracked, is um, better, higher-quality consumer value and experience, right, that delights them, saves them money, saves them time. And this is, this is all happening, right? The end-to-end, the, -end, the, tr the true, and I've heard you be a, a you know, the, the promoter of this way before your, before anybody else, by the way, the idea of the online transaction, but man, we're, we're steps away from that. We're, we're just okay. as an example. One, yeah. One of, one of the things too, that we think led to this, right. Is I think to your point, Brad, when we go back in time and look at the competing interests and the, and the positioning of all the companies and the disruptors, the, the premise, I think that we were actually arguing was, were we solving a problem that the consumers had. And the truth is 97% or whatever the stat is of, of agent or uh, consumers were picking agents, highest metric that's been done, consumer satisfaction was high. And so the, the, there was this theoretical debate around what problem are we solving and, and, and is that just a means to, you know, to do different types of disruption. I think the difference now, the reason you're going to see that unifying against consolidation is the consumer has a real problem. 
they can't safely go and interact with as many people in places, but they still need to transact on real estate. And so now the unifying tent, using your analogy, is that there is this problem, which is we need to do transactions. And so now what you're seeing is lenders leaning in to solve the consumer problem too and allowing more e-signatures. You're seeing counties and states go, we got to get the digital closings because we need that tax revenue and we want to make sure that real estate maintains. And so I think you know, around this tech-enabled consumer, the way that we talk about that at KW is now there's a real problem the consumer has and the, and the agents and the brokerages that are able to lean in and create those solutions to solve those problems are ultimately going to win. Um, and, I, and that's how we, kind of, how we see it at Keller Williams. Now, let me give you an example of that, Josh, and, and jump right back in. But think of it, think of it this way, Brad, and that is um, I'm an agent and we've just closed on a property. And at, at, at that closing, uh, that digital closing, by the way, I asked the question of you, the, the buyer. I say, Brad, um, if interest rates ever change uh, during the lifetime that you own this property and you could save money without spending any money by refinancing, would, would you like to do that? The answer is going to be, well, of course, Gary, if I can save money and don't have to spend any money and say, well, great. So I'm just I'm going to click this button and that's done, because what we've done is we've read your inspection. and We've dumped it in here. We read your contract and dumped it in here. Uh, we have all of your mortgage information in here and we have the complete condition of your home. So when I hit this button now, um, uh, you're on an automatic uh, 24 hour a day, you know, around the clock. Um, uh, service that if interest rates change and they're going to be pinging against your current mortgage in your monthly payment, and if you can save any any money at all, uh, it's going to alert you uh, if you want it to an alert, and it's going to say, "Do you want to refinance your home at no cost?" It'll save you fifty nine dollars a month. It'll save you six hundred dollars a month, whatever it is. And you click yeah, and that's done. And you can set the phone down, and you're 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 good. The other question, right? And, and by the way, that's going to delight and amaze the consumer because they're confused about this, right? They don't, they don't actually understand uh, when I should finance, when I should refinance. And th here's another issue, right? And that is they, they, they're going to say, yeah, but I don't have the money to pay the fees to refinance. But understand that, and I'll use our company as an example, you know, we, we completely reinvented uh, the mortgage transaction, if you will, in such a way that we don't charge origination fee, we don't charge closing costs, we give you a thousand dollars at closing, Brad, and we're constantly pinging against to make sure that we have the best interest rates possible, and that's a very real service. So we can refinance at no cost, and that's just one example. I'll give you one other example for the consumer, and that is now that we've closed, I say, Brad, in addition to that, I just have a question: Do you want to manage your home, or do you want us to manage it? And you go, what do you, I want what to do you mean? I want to manage it, Gary. Yeah, it's not a rental property, so I want to manage it. Say, so great. So, Brad, I've loaded all of my vendors into, all my, my preferred vendors into this app. And we have, um, because we have your inspection report and we know the condition of everything, uh, we now have completed, we, we, we now have a, a, an entire maintenance schedule created for your home. And you can go look at it. Uh, if you like it, if you want, we can set it up on alerts and it'll just remind you to do certain things. Oh, by the way, since you want to manage it, uh, when it alerts you, it'll immediately pop up and say, here are my preferred vendors, Brad, that I recommend that you call to do this. And if you click a button, it's going to set up a scheduler and they're going to schedule a time right then and there with you to go do that. And you can look at their reviews. You can decide if, in fact, you like my vendors uh, that I've, I've uh, you know, put into there. Um but that's fantastic. Can I can I get that right now, Gary? I like that. I would like to use that right um, now. Hey, let me ask I, you, are you are you guys way, okay if we answer, take a question from the, the audience? Question. Well, let me answer the question. Sure. And that is uh, we talked about the fast track disruption. I believe you are going to see that within a year, I think, or or less. I believe everything I just said is is, is coming. Now, that's oh, the that, tech. That is good news for the consumer, I think. Absolutely. So here's the second winner. The second winner is the tech enabled agent. So the consumer wins. Here's how the agent wins. And that is there's a there is a there's an absolute race uh, to harness the value for an agent between physical and digital. Right. And again, the, the relationship so often has been physical based for even the agent. Right. And what's happening now is is operating systems are being created for real estate agents to just run every aspect of their business. And I'll give you an example of this. 
Um, and I'm, 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 you know, I'm only going to, I'm, I'm just going to use me or our company as an example, because I'm not talking about our competitors or anything like that. Uh, they can speak for themselves, but the, um, uh, a good ex a good example is in in our platform we can generate leads for for as little as and keep me honest here Josh for a, a dollar a lead uh, yeah right on average yeah. we did that about we've done over two million times that's right yeah and 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 all of a sudden the real estate agent looks up and says they can dial up and dial down their spend for the amount of leads that they need for a for in a, in a variety of different platforms but that's just an example of of how the the tech enabled agent wins, uh, the second the second way the tech enabled agent wins is that the 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 consumer app that they provide the agent the, their consumer to use excuse me is is actually directly connected to their operating system. So what happens is is that the 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 fiduciary agent is using the functionary tech, if you will in order to to have a connected relationship at all time. So here's the, here's the challenge that some other organizations have uh, outside of general brokerage. And that is they don't actually have uh, fiduciary client relationships, right? They're trying to get the technology to do more and more and more and the agent to do less and less and less. I get that. I understand that business model. I personally believe that the consumer is best served by a fiduciary agent. But I believe in the future it's going to be a fiduciary agent who has an absolute uh, fantastic operating system that is dialed directly in uh, to the consumer uh, app or consumer's browser, right? Uh, and I'll make another statement about this, and that is we're so used to having our website. I'm an agent, I have a website. But understand that what's coming is, is very quickly, is consumer websites. Meaning, right, when I go to Netflix, um, I go to my Netflix. If I go to your Netflix, it looks different. If I go to my Amazon and your Amazon, Brad, they look different. They're not the same thing. Um, when I go to... Um, uh, an agent website, or I go to a third party consumer website, nah, the experience is exactly the same. Every time I go, it doesn't recognize me. It doesn't change. It doesn't morph. Um, it, it, it's, it's not responding to me. And this is what the consumer wants. They want their experience and they want it to recognize them. And every time they use it, they want that, it, they want that to be acknowledged and they want the experience improved. And, and the agent wins when they're the ones that pro connect this for the consumer. Third winner is the brokerage industry, right? The tech-enabled brokerage, absolutely. And the way they, they're going to win if they do a great job of providing these tools for their agents, right? And there's some sort of a really strong combination between uh, digital-based and physically enhanced. And it's not a complicated flip. Um, we're being forced to do it right now. Um, but that's, that's how, that's how general brokerage is going to win. And here's the last statement I'll make. Gary, can and I, that is, go ahead. Can, can I ask you a quick question here from the audience? Do you mind? Not at all. I have one last statement to make and then I'm done. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Okay. So the la here's the only other statement I wanted to make, Brad, for everyone. And that is at the end of the day, the platform always wins. So the, the tech-enabled consumer, the tech-enabled agent, the tech-enabled brokerage, if those are, the, those are the, 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 the men and women who are going to be the biggest winners in all of this. But here's what absolutely wins no matter who you are, and that's the platform. And what's, what's going to happen and is happening right now is disconnected software that says it's a platform and has some analytics that, that make it act like a platform they're going to get exposed. They're going to get exposed fast, right? And this is the because that, this is the, in the way you know that, and the way we think of that, Gary, right, is that when it's you know it's connected platform, you can provide that digital experience of the transaction, the digital experience of the showing from consumer through the agent through transaction, and all that has to happen on the same operating system, and that's the power of that. Yeah. So if we so if we think about if we sorry I used blue it doesn't show very well. Um, so if we so if you think about um, if this is the platform, what's changed is before the consumer and the agent and the brokerage, these were all software programs and they're being connected like this. And what's changed is this is actually, if you want to just use layman's terms, this is the software right here. 
And these are just applications, right? And as a result of that, this agent, as just as a simple example, knows everything that actually everything that's going on. So I want you to imagine again, because because you know that when a when a consumer is doing something, uh, you know what that is. You now know when consumer behavior turns into a listing, and then you know when it turns gotcha. into a closing. So think about it again, an agent goes to their database and the platform says, Brad, you need to contact the Smiths in the next 90 days because their behavior, their behavior around real estate, not whether they got uh, married or divorced or had kids or whatever, their behavior around real estate is, is niche as the pattern of people that list in 90 days. And I want you to imagine this. So then the agent takes the listing and a contract comes in. And by the way, the, the app reads the contract, dumps it into a, 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 a digital format where everybody can just negotiate right there, right? Reads the PDF and, and everyone negotiates. But while you're negotiating, the platform says you have a 91% chance of getting this deal accepted. And you go, what? Gotcha. Gary, can I, can I take a couple questions that's from it. the audience? Are we yeah, cool yeah, with yeah that? I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, that's it. I didn't interrupt you this time. I'm not in trouble, no, right? Just, <laughs> no, you didn't. I stood up and I sat okay, down, good. too. You, you are a gentleman. Thank you. So one from Sean Murphy. What does Gary intend for the huge brick and mortar market centers in the digital age? It's kind of like Barnes & Noble. Are you, are you going, to, if you move mm -hmm. physical to digital, isn't it time we close all that stuff? Not at all. I added no. to Sean's question. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, not at all. That would be like you're never going to have Inman live again. We're only we're only going to see you virtually for the rest of our life. And none of us would like Great that. answer. And yeah, and cuz I know you don't like that. So that that would be your answer to Sean. Heck no, that ain't going to happen. Right? But you're going to blend it. You're learning how to blend this uh, in in as best a way as possible. And we're going to discover that some things should be done digitally and others are going to be physical. A lot of people, just as a, a, a side statement, there are a lot of real estate agents who are going to say, I love my family, but I'm more productive when I leave the home and I, I go meet people here or I work with my team here or I get this here. There are limitations to digital, by the way. There are limitations. So, well, no, that's Gary, not going to happen. The ways that we think of that as well is, retail itself is in challenge right now, but that doesn't mean all retail is dead. And I think Brad answered this question or the way that we think as well is what we have to make sure we have interesting and compelling physical spaces. And we are reimagining what does that look like and how does that, how do we use the square footage to make sure we're completely giving the most value and we need to have exciting physical spaces. So boring retail is in trouble. Boring retail is dead. Boring real estate offices are in trouble. Boring real estate offices are dead. But real estate offices themselves are still, uh, in fact, a lot of people are itching to get back. And I think we have an opportunity as a real estate community to reimagine what the bro real estate brokerage office looks like in the future. Yeah, that's exactly Let me right. ask another question. This from, thank you guys, from Valerie yeah. Garcia. And I think maybe this We've run out of time. We've gone over time. And we're not taking away any time from you guys. If you see differently, tell me. But uh, is it just me, Valerie asks, or are all the current events of the world making you want to simplify? Less words, mm -hmm. more meaning, less smash it up, yes. more bring it together. And I think this gets a good area for us to end on. Is this? I think you did a great job. We didn't touch on too much of the economy, but I think we got that in the earlier session. Certainly on the, the digital renaissance, um, the partnership, you know, the higher order, the collaboration, but this moral imperative, Gary, I think the words were so right on when you use that. Uh, the moral, I think that's what Valerie's asking here is, is, you know, how do we keep it simpler? How do we get into action? But any comments on that whole area? Like, it is a moral issue. It is a challenge. How do we step that up as an industry? But keep it simple, I think, is what Valerie's implying. I wish she was here to ask it more, but um, just take a stab at that big you, duty we now have as leaders in the industry. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the way that, that Josh and I think about this is as businessmen, uh, we're apolitical, but we're not amoral. Um, and I believe that this is what I said when we started. And that is there is a call for all of us uh, to not be amoral and to actually take take a, a stand that people understand this is our position. And, and then asking how can we, how, what are the simple things that we can do in order to make a difference? And that's the biggest issue, right? 
uh, I hope I answered that question. The the the, 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 only, uh, you, you, is, the only thing I would add too is that go I ahead, think our position as well is that in in independent of, of the, the current events happening now, I think our perspective as well is the reason we're here and we've been very transparent about our roadmap and our strategies, about the data we find, about what we're seeing work, what we're seeing don't work is we absolutely believe that, and I think you know you can go back and see we've been very consistent in saying this, when there's a competition for creating value for agents between us and all of our competition, the agents and the consumers win there. And so we invite the world. We want to share our ideas. We want to share our learnings because we all get better when when the when the when the, can you think the blade of, of competition makes you know, makes us stronger. And I think the some of that divert, diversification, some of that uh, animosity that we had before was you just had a lot of players making big bets with a lot of free capital, knowing that there had to be a change. And now that we're in this cha- this this change climate, now that the the end is of this of this tra- tra- that transition. Is, is very in front of us, I think you're going to see the consolidation. I think you're going to see the mergers. I think you're going to see the simplification of these solutions become ever present. And ultimately, when we all start just focusing on how to provide more value to agents and their businesses, then ultimately agents win at every brokerage and their consumers win at every brokerage. And that's what kind of our, our ultimate philosophy. That's it. Well said. Thank you, Josh. Any last word, Gary, for the uh, Inman community, which is big overlap with your community? You know, um, I'll just say this, and you said this um, uh, at the beginning, um, uh, you and I are sparky with each other, but the thing that, that um, and we have a long history of that, by the way, but the, the thing that I just want to communicate to everybody is, you are a good guy, man. You, you are, and you, uh, and you know, and I, I want to say this, um, I think that the work you do has gotten better. And it would be wrong of me not to acknowledge that, my friend. And um, right, you, you're going to tell me when I'm I'm off, and I'm going to tell you when you're off. But at the end, um, you know what? I appreciate you, and I think everyone watching appreciates you and what you're trying to accomplish for all of us. So um, I just want to say thanks. And uh, and uh, if you want to get Sparky, call me. And um, <laughs> You and I, you and I can do, you can I do that fast. What I love is, is that this is not the time for that. This, this is not. Uh, this is a time for locking arms, um, literally, digitally or physically, and and understanding that um, we're all in this together, and the only way we win is by being together. There you go, take Gary, and that's a a great. Great way to end it, and uh, and I heard you say take a stand. We need to do that. And so back take at you stand. with what you said about snarky and snappy or whatever it is. And this is Brad Inman closing out with two big important leaders in the industry, Gary Keller and Josh Team. Later on, gang. Thanks. How great was that? Um, if we were in person, we would get like a big round of applause right now. So just want to do it, do it from home. I'm trying to hide my nails, as you can see. Uh, Anywho, um, we have a lot of great stuff coming up this afternoon, including what I'm most excited about. I get to interview Ryan Serhant from the um, comfort of my home office, so please tune in for that. Uh, Up next, we have the data track with Sam DeBoard and Danae Evans and Woman Up with Deborah Trappen, or I'm sorry, Deborah Trappen. I have a secret for you guys. I put my own little cue cards underneath the camera because I'm doing this alone, which is pretty fun. And Sarah Sudachan. And if I killed that name, Sarah, you can come for me later. Uh, I love all of you. Also, ton of presentations coming up, virtual roundtables. You can meet the exhibitors, which how cool is that? You can still go meet the exhibitors, which have some of the coolest new products and systems and technology ever always. That's one thing I was worried we were going to miss out on. Um, That's today from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern, 10 to 11 Pacific. And then you can always go back to the schedule tab on the event website and uh, add things to your personalized schedule because this whole system is just pretty fantastic. And I think, honestly, the first part of today went fabulous. So uh, jump in there, go to that. I'll see you later this afternoon, and we'll continue to have some fun. Thanks.